Okay, so welcome to the IPSEC path. Today I want to talk about some problems we are facing when we try to improve the IPSEC performance recently. So, these are my topics. And the idea is that I give a short introduction on each topic and then I have some questions on these topics where I hope to get some answers or at least some discussion on it, okay? So let's start with the first topic. That is, we wanna avoid frame copy in IPsec. So what's the problem here? The problem is that most of the data frames are linearized before we have to pass that to the crypto layer. So why is that? This is because the crypto layer does crypto in place, so we have to pass writable buffers to the crypto layer. And that we are doing just by linearize it, and after that, the buffer is writable. So we want to avoid this, and how we want to do this? Well, on Rx side, that's pretty easy, because we can know if the buffer is writable. It's just that it does not need to be cloned, or the TX shared flag must not be set. In this case, we can just write to the buffer. So the solution is pretty easy. We just linearize if the buffer is not writable. So on the transmit part, it's a little bit more complicated because IPSec packets usually have a trailer. So we need a space to copy the trailer to the buffer. So here we have to somehow expand the tail of the buffer to get the trailer on it. So what can we do here? Well, the solution would be we could just add a page fragment with the tail width to the buffer. But there is a small problem. This works in all cases. It works just if we really have at least one slot free to add this fragment. So question here would be, can we instrument somehow the stack to generate these kind of buffers? And well, on local send, it's probably possible because TCP tries to use high order pages, so we have not more than three to four fragments per buffer. And actually when I tried to implement that, I started to try it and I faced strange bugs. And it took me quite a while to debug that. And it turned out that the problem was that the crypto layer always assumed to have all the null pages in the scatter list, which is kind of incompatible to how we generate buffers in the networking. So first question here would be, oh, is there a reason for that? Or can we just change the crypto layer to handle high order pages like networking is, does it? I mean, changing the crypto layer is not that hard. This is done with a couple of small patches, but I'm actually not sure if I'm allowed to do that. So is there a reason that the crypto layer does that? I mean, anyone familiar with the crypto layer who could? Pro, yeah, yeah I, I thought it too, but I was not exactly sure. Maybe we should talk to the crypto guys. So let's continue forwarding. Since a couple of years, we built on generic receive offload full size buffers with fragless. And the problem with this kind of buffers is that we cannot add a page fragment with the IPsec tables to these buffers because, well, all slots are full and we even have fragless on it. So. <clears throat> I mean, this leads even to a general forwarding problem because such buffers cannot be offloaded to hardware, so we need to linearize and segment them in the stack, which is for performance really bad. So it's not just an IPsec problem. Everybody who wants to forward such packets will face this problem. So question here is whether we can find some consents to build fair buffers for local receive and forwarding. The commit in question was done by Eric Demosat, and yeah, I talked to him, and he has already some solutions to propose, so maybe you want to talk something about that? So yeah, we just merged a patch to be able to limit the number of frag uh, in TCP stack. So the idea was to extend this the use of this syscontrol in GRO layer, so you can uh, limit the number of frag on the input bus. 
So if you want to limit to 10, just set the syscontrol to 10. So the default limit is being 17. Normally, this frag list should no longer be uh, built anywhere by Jero. Yeah, I mean, so that's basically a revert of this patch. Yeah, I mean, that's what I did on my RFC patch. Sir. Yeah, sure. Oh, yeah. I'm totally OK with the <laughs> RFC. <laughs> But at the same time, that would mean that if we, for example, limit the number of SKP uh, of frags, uh, you're not able to use IPsec over other medias anymore because the reason is like to provide an upper limit, and that does not. So it's a replacement for max for, for the maximum, and yeah. that doesn't really mean that you can now go beyond that maximum. So probably we need to yeah, we, to add. We, if, if no, no. The, the idea is to know. Not anymore generate uh, the, the frag list. Not zero. Uh, I mean, if the frag list is full, we can fall back and copy the buffer. That's what we can do always, but I want really to avoid this. So the idea is to have one slot free for the IPsec trailer, and then we're done. Anyway, the, 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 there was this issue with. Um, I don't remember if this was a Xen or they had the um, oh, infinite bomb. They wanted to add a, a frag like, like exactly the, the same than, than you. They have the same problem of having to linearize. That's why they put this this uh, patch okay. uh, into TCP stack to limit the number of fragments. But that was only a part of the problem because they were not addressing the zero layer or the the turn. Uh, layer, so yeah, it was I mean, a first a start for the yeah, I mean, if the patch addressing away, the problem. Pretty good. I mean, then the problem is solved. <laughs> yeah, it's good. OK, so any other comments? Um, I would like to propose something more uh, drastic um, than finding um, you know, a minute solution just for IPsec, but something which will probably require to make m m much more drastic and best changes in the Linux kernel. But this is based on past experience with other operating system, namely VxWorks, that uh, I think that the best thing is to add a um, kernel configuration option, which will be reserve head and tail room for SKB buffers for certain operations, for example, IPsec, and, uh, okay, and, uh, I think that's not easy. Yes, I didn't say it's easy, but I think that's a lot, of, a much more bigger investment, but I, but I think it would pay off, because I, I've hit the same problems uh, writing a virtual kernel driver back three, three and a half years ago, and, uh, TCP send message, you are allocating SKB, but you are putting the, the data in frag. So the, the tail room is no longer available for the crypto layer. So anyway, this doesn't solve the, the problem. Yes, so if okay. we want to have tail room, we have to pull the data out of the pages to the head SKB, and that's what we want to avoid. So that's the reason why we use the fraps. More comments? Okay, so let's continue. Next topic would be generic receive offload. We want to add the generic receive offload for IPsec. And well, what we have to do, we just have to add handles for IPsec protocols. I did that. Code is there, and it works pretty well, I think. There's, well, just one minor problem I see with that, and that is because now the stack doesn't see IPsec packets anymore. Tools like TCP dump just see the clear text packets, and IPsec packets are completely gone from the Rx part, part. So, question is, should we make this somehow configurable, or can we just switch the default to GRO? I'm not sure how the users would react if you update your kernel and suddenly all IPsec packets are gone. Could be a bad experience, I don't know. 
Any thoughts on that? Well, I think it would be rather drastic because also it affects, of course, the package filtering rule sets and so on. And, and I think it affects basically all part of the user space setup. So I understand why you want to do it, but I think it has a huge potential of breaking uh, a lot of configurations. Maybe. Or at least not, not, yeah, not behaving like they expected. So yeah, I'm, I'm very, uh, I would be very careful with such uh, changes. I mean, the performance impact is really huge. I mean, like no doubt, no doubt. But making it the default automatically? Yeah, sure. That's why I'm asking. Yeah. I mean, we, we could do it somehow configurable. Maybe just that we push security association to the device. And only with this security association we do it. I mean, can, you, can you explain why the stack does not see IPsec packets? Because I don't understand. Well, the uh, TCP time to tap is after we decrypt the packets. If we do it at layer two with the GRO handlers, so we decrypt packets and maybe we aggregate TCP packets off that and we push them up to the stack. And the tap for TCP dump is shortly before we enter layer three. The packets are already decrypted there. Yeah, but you still see the packet in TCP dump? Yes, but no IPsec. Okay. So first thing I do when I set up an IPsec gateway. But I mean, when you, we use TCP dump on the normal GRO uh, packets, uh, TCP dump show, shows, shows a single yes, logical packet. So a I single mean, IP header, a single TCP header. But yeah, we know right. that I mean, not it's not true. We received. I mean, but it's maybe a little difference because, well. We should, maybe you should know that we so did IPsec. I guess the problem basically is that tutorials showed for a long time that you can verify your IPsec is working, that you yeah. can TCP dump yeah. on the interface that, and you see ESP. If I set up gateway, I look at TCP dump, if I see ESP packets. And I think probably other people we do will do the same. So. so I guess I agree with Harald that it might be Problematic. So there is a one way to, to do that it would be to by default enable GRO, but disable GRO for IPsec if the promiscuous flag is set or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe with sys control or we could push security associations to the network interface and we just do GRO for these security association that are present at the network interface so the user knows what he's doing so uh, we have a similar uh, setup today, right, with um, uh, like VXSign or any kind of tunnel packet, right? We often have a separate adapter that gets the, the inner headers. So you sniff on the outer headers if you sniff on the physical port, and you, you get the inner headers if you sniff, if you sniff on the VLAN device, right? So could we, if you need to do investigation or debug of the network, I don't think it's unfair to say you have to do something extra when you're doing IPv sec with GSF, GRO. Yeah. Right, so um, IPv sec, <laughs> IPv sec. Uh, so um, my question is, is uh, I don't know if we could instantiate a, a debug device on the fly that would let you have the two layers, if should you need them. Uh, it's just a thought, you know, to do a separation of responsibility, right? Um, yeah. As it stands today, if you turn off GRO on the physical interface, you know, that's, that's the spot where you turn the knob is on the physical interface, then you just turn off GRO. Even though it's a stack thing, you're, the only place that you have a control is on the physical interface, right? So, yeah, or, or you just, you know, when you, when you say IP link create device something, maybe it has the side effect of turning off GRO on the physical device, and so you get this debug. Or maybe we just make it dependent on the promise flag, and in case we have promise, you push both packets up the stack. So we just copy the IPsec one and make it like a debug frame in SKP and drop it after it received the AF packet yeah. handler. That might also be like affecting in future we have probably offloading for IPsec. And I guess that people also want to like additionally debug the, the receiving frames, even so offloading is in effect. 
I think, um, and I really don't want to drag this too long, but sorry, I think it, um, I mean, we have educated users for a decade now that they will not see the decrypted packets on IPsec, and this is the way how things should behave. And uh, I mean, doing a change, okay, nice and good, but it would be very different from what people have been used to ever since IPsec was integrated into the mainline kernel. Sure. So, but yeah. another thing is we want to add hardware offloads for IPsec, and the packets are gone anyway. I mean. Yeah, but that's, as a user, you then explicitly do something to enable yeah, the hardware outlet, or you specifically choose a hardware right, or something that's, like that's that. That's why I asked that. I expected that the user probably wants to have some knob that he knows what is going to happen there. Okay. So let's continue. Close in time. So let's move on to the transmit path. We want to do GSO for IPsec2. So actually, we have already GSO for the transforms, but it's hap it happens really early at the transforms layer. So what we want to do is now we want to move to existing GSO code path from the transforms layer to the generic GSO layer at layer two. Because then we have longer the big packets in the stack and don't need to process each small pa packet. So how to do this? Well, the idea is that we just do the tunnel and, or transport mode encapsulation at the transport layer, and we just add a dummy ESP header that, well, the packet is marked as ESP, and after that we do, well, we push the packet, the big packet, unencrypted down the stack, and at the GSO layer we add full ESP header information and do the decryptions on the segments there. So I have code for that too, works, and some cases, but there are problems. So one of the problems is how to handle asynchronous crypto operations in the GSO layer. The GSO layer isn't prepared for that at all, so... Well, I actually, I don't exactly know how to do that. And then immediately, other question what came to my mind was, I mean, what are we doing when the <coughs> NIC driver says it's busy after asynchronous crypto operation? So now we have some packet and we have to do something with that. So what? I mean, I can offer some possible solutions on that. So for question one, one thing that came to my mind is, well, just add callbacks for each GSO handler. But when I start to implement that, I immediately notice that, well, we have to add really for each and every protocol handler a callback, and that's not going to work. I mean, this looked awful. So I thought, well, what else can we do? So next thing came to my mind, maybe we could use some kind of crypto queue disk. This would answer both questions, but well, the concept of a queue disk is not really what I wanted to have there. And queue disks usually are configurable, and that one would definitely not be configurable. So I skipped this. And next thing, what I thought what we could do is, well, we could just handle the encapsulation at the GSO layer for the segments. And if you return from GSO, we do the crypto operations. In this case, we can handle asynchronous crypto. So this would answer question one, but not question two. So looking at question two, one thing what we could do, well, we could just enqueue the packet again to the queue disk. But then we run again the whole QDisk layer, we count the packet twice to QDisk, and it's probably not a really good solution. So what else? We could, for example, take a separate queue and process it with the TX software <coughs> queue. That's how I currently implemented it, and it sort of works. So these are my solutions I had to that, but maybe someone else has a better idea on that. Um, so, uh, asynchronous crypto means that the crypto operation... Yeah, it returns okay. in progress and you get a callback. We can't use FPU in... Uh, I mean, uh, it's head of line blocking, right? Uh, the, the GSO operation uh, happens after the DQ of uh, the, the QDisk, while the, you are supposed to to push the data on the, the, the real device. 
So if you take a lot of time to perform the operation, you have an idle device. You don't send anything on a device. I don't think. Asynchronous crypto is, for example, if you use ANF-NI and the FPU unit is not free, then it uses this to work you and tells you that it does the crypto operation later and you have to handle this somehow. Wouldn't it make sense to just remove asynchronous crypto operations <clears throat> and make them synchronous by... So I know, for example, that recent Intel, uh, Intel chips like have a faster FX safe and FX restore operation. So you basically disable preemption, force the FPU state out into some um, scratch space, process like 64 packets and then do the FX restore, enable preemption and send that out. Yeah, I mean, would require changes to the crypto layer. Yeah. Probably makes more sense to me than all of your possible solutions so far. So I think the problem here is that the GSO layer runs on the pH, so we block the bottom half. Yeah. So I'm not sure you can do all this stuff anywhere because. Yeah, I mean, I can push the pack to work you even if bottom half are off. So I just have to continue somehow, and I need a callback from the crypto layer. If I do it the way that I just do the encapsulation for the segments at the GSO, and then I wait until all callbacks are done, and after that I immediately... I mean, you cannot wait here. You're, you're not supposed to. Yes, I can't so. wait. I just do, well, I, pu I push it to the crypto layer and then I process the next packet and wait what the crypto layer is doing. It, I mean, it sort of works, but it's really not nice. Actually, exactly the right person is entering at the right point in time because I would wonder if, if doing it at that late point where actually the Q-disk already wants to push the packet to the device, Adding additional delay there, I think, is not just a cosmetic or additional asynchronity is not just a cosmetic issue, but it basically confuses the entire queue discipline and the scheduling of, of outbound packets. So I'm, I'm wondering whether this is really something that should be done at this point or not. Um, I understand why you want to do it, but still it upsets any but the most basic uh, scheduling that you want to do with the packets on, on the transmit path. Maybe one idea would be to make the GSO stuff for crypto asynchronous uh, before then queuing on the queue disk. Uh, because you are in process context and you can do whatever you want and it's, it doesn't prevent other threads from queuing back <laughs> yeah, yet. I mean, that, that was the idea with the crypto queue disk, that I just add something in front of the queue disk, do everything and push it to the real queue. We, we want GSO, you know, to avoid um, traversing the IP stack and night net filter stack for every single MSS. Uh, the the QDIC stuff itself, I'm not sure it's the huge win here. It is, for sure, but it's not the... If it makes things absolutely a nightmare, well, you know. Yeah. Um, I would like to offer a different point of view. Um, applications which are real-time sensitive, um, you do have some kind of challenge working with Linux, and some of these challenges has been addressed by the RT patch. And I think we have to be a little bit careful when we introduce changes which might make uh, blocking at the bottom half for a long time or offload things to software queues which will uh, in turn uh, make the next RT patch even more challenging and uh, we might want to I know once again I'm probably offering ma maybe some more drastic change to the Linux kernel but I think we do have to you know take an open mind uh, approach and consider doing things a little bit differently, maybe offloading things to kernel threads. So, you know, you won't have blocking at the bottom half, 
and uh, you won't have uh, you know all kind of real time applications like voice having jitter and delay. Yeah, I know it's once again a very big change in how the the, the uh, uh, Linux kernel networking works, but at least maybe for this specific case, I think we should, you know, at least give it a thought. We can always, you know, disqualify it after thinking for five minutes. But, uh, you know, uh, you know that I think that the alternative that going for, you know, a software queue bottom half approach or long blocking and then having a lot of uh, problems with real time applications and having to, to make another patch which will be very difficult to, to integrate and... Um... We, we exit immediately after offloading the operations to crypto, we exit. But anyway, we keep it configurable, so if you want to use real-time, you just don't need to configure it. Yeah, I'm just, you know, talking about suggestion here and possible solution Q2 at the bottom, so I'm referring to all of uh, this, just, you know, Let's move on. We're close in time. So I wanted to present some performance numbers, what we got. I mean, the numbers were shown already yesterday in Sewing Mini's talk. She measured transport mode performance and started by the baseline, what we currently get. And here we get 2.6 gbps per second if we just measure stack performance without crypto. If we use crypto, we're at 2.17 gbps per second. So if we add our changes we did recently, we increase uh, from 2.6 gbit per second to 8 gbit per second, pure stack performance, which is quite, I think, a huge improvement. And even for the crypto case, we can double the performance with that. So I think it's worth to consider these things. So, and then we looked at the bottlenecks where they are now. So if you just measure stack performance, the bottlenecks are the segmentation and the checksumming of the segments. And if you do crypto, well, that's pretty clear, crypto is the bottleneck. If you look at these two bottlenecks, then it comes clear what are the next steps. So we have to somehow move segmentation and crypto operations away from the network and CPUs. So how to do that? Well, I can offer two solutions. One is that what I'm doing currently, I separate into networking and crypto CPUs with the parallel crypto template. This works kind of good, but it helps only on the crypto bottleneck. The segmentation remains. Other solution would be to ask hardware to do IPsec operations that would solve the segmentation and the crypto bottleneck. And exactly this, this leads to the next topic. We want to add somehow hardware offload for IPsec. So how should this be done? Well, here I'm basically free. All I want to have is that the API that this is using should be pretty close or the same for the, as the GSO, GRO API we are using in the stack because I want to consider this as a software fallback. So question would be how should the API for IPsec hardware offloads should look like or more general? What would the NIC driver need from the stack? Not sure if we can just, okay. So, but here I would need input from the driver developers. Anyone wants to speak up here? Hi, uh, Boris from Melanox. Uh, we are working on some uh, IPsec offloads at the moment. And uh, what we would require from the stack uh, is uh, uh, two things. The first is an ability to mark uh, decrypted packets. So IPsec, uh, so IPsec wouldn't decrypt and uh, wouldn't attempt to decrypt. And uh, the second thing uh, is the ability to Mm. Mark the SA as floated, mm. so we could recognize that uh, we have it in the hardware and delete it, edit, so we have et to Push down some, somehow the security association to the hardware. But, yeah, but not the policies, right? Right.
Okay. Um, first of all, uh, I, I made that comment uh, yesterday. I would like to repeat that here. Offload does not have to be to a NIC driver. Once again, I think Intel has representative in, in this uh, conference, but Intel has two uh, offload chips called Cave Creek and Coletta Creek, which is pure offload without NIC. So you can take the buffer, send it to the encryption or decryption hardware, and, and get the result back. And it, just, it does not involve any, any NIC. So I think that should be separate as well. I mean, it only helps if we can do TFO and crypto. So we have to push the big packets to the network card because the, we have to segment before we do the crypto. So whatever we do. Yeah. Uh, Stefan, have you talked to Hubbard Zoo? Because he's been doing the Intel devices. Uh, no, I uh, It would be a good idea to contact him. Hubbard, uh, I can send you the email if you want. Yes, I know him, but. Uh, okay, yeah. Have tried to ping him and see. Uh, talk to him, yes. Yeah. Well, so the, the, the whole idea of having the crypto done on the NIC is that, that you avoid passing the PCI bus twice. <coughs> Once to send the packet to the crypto engine, three times, then three times. three times. So that's a huge win. So you cannot say, oh, you just use a crypto engine on a dedicated uh, hardware. It's better to use that on the NIC. It's faster. It's three times faster. <laughs> Once again, it, it, it is very system dependent because some systems are limited by CPU resources and not by uh, I/O or PCI Express resources. We have systems which have like uh, perhaps uh, 60 lanes of gentry, which is a lot, a lot of bandwidth, but uh, reach uh, 80 or 100 percent CPU utilization. So we're not worried about uh, the loss of I/O bandwidth, but you're worried about offloading the CPU. Okay, maybe we can talk offline about a topic later. I think a couple of people want to meet after lunch. So anyone wants to invite to join. So I have one final topic. It was this was we have still some read write, write locks in the transform code. This was proposed from Eric as a topic. I'm not sure if we want to talk too much about it. I think it just needs a volunteer who wants to do it and well. So I think we're done now. Thank you.